When were times easy and when was business easy? It's business. It's the nature of it. I mean, you signed up for this. And if you want somebody else to deal with all the headaches and all the challenges, then you can go work for someone. But because you decided that you wanted to start a law firm, I mean, you are signing up for being in the arena. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. This is Jessica, head of coaching strategy at Chris, and today we're flipping the script for another special edition episode to get Michael's take on why it's better to try and fail than not try at all, how compelling visions drive transformational growth, and how to build an ambitious and resilient team. You're not gonna get resilient by thinking about being resilient or reading about being resilient. You're gonna get more resilient when you're facing difficult situations and you persist and you push through them. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. All right, let's do it, another AMMA. We're back for another AMMA. I was thinking about the children. I don't know if we have any children listening, but our children, you know, lately we've been doing bedtime. We have been watching the, those like memories that pop up on your phone where it's like the, the compilation of like photos and they turn them into a video. It's, it's amazing, man. Like, like these kids grow up fast, right? Like you, you see like here's trips that we took and, you know, particularly like the younger one likes to watch these things. I see and pictures, pictures, like, pictures, pictures. And we're sitting there and you're like, you're watching these kids like grow up before your eyes. And you're like, man, like it wasn't too long ago. Like you know, they weren't even walking and talking now. They're doing all those things. And it's just one thing, you know, stopped me in my tracks the other day was when the, uh, the oldest one was not like daddy. She said, dad, I said, I said, who, <laughs> since when did that transition happen? When do we go from daddy to dad? Yeah. Right. So it's these precious moments, but also I think back to like my childhood and this is before, like, you know, we really had cell phones and the cameras on phones. And I don't really remember a whole lot before I was, you know, before I was four years old. Of course, yeah. But I have to think the kids these days will remember more because so much more of it is documented. Like you got videos oh, and photos yeah. and they're watching them again and again and again. So maybe they will remember some of these trips. Maybe not. Maybe. They'll ask to see random photos sometimes from like two years ago. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's impressive, actually. They're like, Daddy, when, when did I start walking? Right? Like we were watching this episode of Bluey. And it was like the episode, it was called The Baby Race, yes. which is a great, yes. great episode. And our oldest is asking me, she's like, when did I start walking? And I was like, okay, it was at this moment. I think, I think, right? Because allegedly at the preschool, when these kids have these life changes, they don't want to spoil them. So they won't tell them like, oh, your kid just walked for the first time. They're going to like wait and not tell you that. And then you'll see it at home. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to give it away. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, just interesting thinking back about all these memories. I don't know if that has anything to do with the AMMA today, but just if you haven't put up on your phone, the memories app, we had one come up. It was just like, here's the month of June. Yeah. And like all the things we did in June. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like you just look back at like every single thing. It's like, that's a lot. We, you know, we did so much with the kids and it, it's just amazing to do that. So anyway, that's probably not why you guys are tuning in. But if you have children, you know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about and just cherish those memories. But if you don't have children, that's okay too. You know, we got an AMMA for you. Okay. So <laughs> it has nothing to do with children. It has nothing to do with children. But if you do have a question that has anything to do with, let's say leadership or culture or marketing or growing and scaling a law firm or anything like that, you can text us at 404-531-7691. And we may just answer your question on the podcast. There's also the other types of episodes we do, which is the traditional interview format. We bring in an expert from the legal industry, even outside the legal industry. And then we ask them all sorts of questions, present their insights here on the podcast. And then the encore editions where we bring back some more, more popular episodes and you get to re-listen to those. You know, sometimes you're at a different place. It's like when you reread a book, you know, it had one meaning to you when you first read it. Now you're undergoing, you know, something else in the business. Like when I've reread business books, they've had completely different takeaways at different periods of time when I read them. 
So I think it's incredibly valuable to be able to do. Sometimes you don't need more books. You sometimes need to just be able to pull away more lessons from the same book. So how crazy would it be to reread the same book five times? Like how many times have those listening, have you read The Game Changing Attorney? Right. I read it again the other day. It came out in 2018. And I was like, still holds up. Pretty yeah. good. Obviously, every time you read something, you're in a different place. So you're going to pull away different insights. And with that, Jessica, speaking of insights, what insights, or what see, questions what do we have we can drop on the today. table today. Yes. All right. So let's talk about evolution. Okay. All, All right. right. So question number one, as my firm has grown, I've noticed it's becoming harder to keep that innovative spark alive across the team as a whole. How do I ensure that innovation isn't just coming from me, but is something that everyone in the organization is contributing to? Mm, okay. I guess this person's asking, you're like, why are you coming up with all the ideas? It's frustrating. It's like, why is every idea got to come from you? Oh, I've heard this. Anyone ever feel this way? Where it's like anything we do, you have been the chief innovation officer at the organization and at your firm since the inception. And sometimes you wish, you know, somebody else would come up with a good idea, right? Because you're just tapped out of ideas. You may not be. But it would be nice if others came to you with ideas, recommendations, ways in which the firm can grow and innovate. It would be nice too. So how do you do that? How do you instill a culture of innovation across your firm? And I, I will tell you that one of the reasons why in many firms this does not exist, and I've been guilty of this myself as well, is because you're giving everybody all the answers. So when you give all the answers, you don't really give anybody the opportunity to think. So what happens if you didn't provide everyone with all the answers? Well, then they'd have no choice but to burn some calories, mental calories, and think critically. And one of the ways you know, we do this now, so this actually came up even recently. So we are looking at you know, a couple of evolutions, evolutions of some of our service offerings. I won't share what they are yet, right? You may hear about it at the summit in November. But as we've been you know, working through these, you know, I have my ideas and my perspectives on them, but I wanted to see what our leadership team and some other team members could come up with. But the challenge sometimes when you start like you know, these brainstorming sessions, there's like no structure to it whatsoever. Someone's going to present something to you. You can't even tell if it's a good idea or a bad idea if it makes any business sense whatsoever. So you have to have some sort of guidelines and frameworks around this stuff. And what I ended up doing is I created this like document and I presented this to one of our team leads, essentially saying like, I would like for you to come up with some ideas and strategies and research around an evolution of this specific particular offering. And I'll help you and I'll support you. But here are, the, here are essentially the general guidelines, right? It still has to be true to this. It has to align with our values. It has to be something that would be valuable to our clients. It has to be something that makes logistical sense. It has to be something that obviously makes sense within the ecosystem of the business. I outlined all the, the variables and criteria that would align with it being you know, an idea worth presenting, right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good idea or a bad idea, but essentially now this is what can make it a viable idea of here are the things you have to think through that must be true in you know, the framework of what you're going to present. And then, you know, encouraging them to do research in this area, provide them with the resources and the support to be able to do that. If they wanted to do some, you know, we say like R&D, like research and development, giving them budget to try out a bunch of things. And then coming back and saying, okay, well, we're going to do this cadence. So I kind of laid this out on like a three to four week cadence of like, when we meet, you're going to present essentially, here are the different ideas that you have. And then whichever one we deem like viable and worth pursuing further for that one, then we're going to allocate more budget to it. So you can be able to test it and iterate upon it, gain a little bit more you know, depth of understanding and see like how we could you know, how we could approach this. This is before we discuss anything in the way of like logistics or pricing strategy or anything like that at all. And then after we determine its actual viability practically, right? Because we always test on ourselves first. Then we would start up some alpha, like, you know, you know almost like alpha or beta you know, pilot case studies with some of our firms just to run it by them, see if it's be valuable to them as well, right? So this is part of like the market research, but also in terms of like case studies and implementation of determining, you know, the efficacy of it. And once we've gotten some of that data back, then we can, you know, discuss next steps. Let's say it's positive. Then we can determine the logistical framework of it, any like needs in terms of scaling capacity or capabilities internally. And, you know, it's kind of walking through the process of like how you take something from an idea to actually executing it in terms of a service offering in this case, right? So we're working on that on a week to week basis. I'm not the one coming up with all the ideas. They're providing with the framework and I'm just providing the resources and the support and the feedback. So that's how you do it. And, and we're actually doing this across a number of different departments because we have a number of different things going on. And there's different team leads that I'm doing these types of projects with that essentially it's in, in many respects, it's like their brainchild. I'm just there to provide like the resources and the support they need to be able to determine its level of viability and kind of walking them through what I was doing on my own before, but essentially showing them like, how do you take something from inception to execution? And then just walking them through that sort of framework rather than saying, let's do this. And then I already know what I want to do. And then here's exactly how to map it out. And here's exactly what to do. Because then if you do that that way, 
you're not going to have a team of critical thinkers. You're just going to have a team of order takers. Yeah, I would actually add that it takes a great deal of restraint from the leader. Oh, yeah. Because you do have these. But then at the end of the day, when it comes back to the question, like you're like, oh, I'm tired of solving everything. You kind of created that situation for yourself because you've always just done it because you want to move quickly or whatever that may be. I was actually working with the leader this week and I said, hey, we need to come up with a solution to X, Y, Z. And this person said, here, why don't we just figure it out in five minutes? I said, no, why don't I assign it to the person who needs to learn how to figure it out and then get the answer? I can solve it. But again, you have to empower that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you want to have a depth of knowledge and insights. One of our core values is better than yesterday. So we're always encouraging like continuous learning and growth and development. To drive innovation, you constantly have to be learning. You constantly have to be taking interest in different, you know, different types of businesses and different industries. If you were to obsess over something and you were to learn it, like we, it's just, this, this comes up with the law firms and social media all the time. Like for some law firms, social media is like this thing that they don't understand. And they think like, well, I still don't get it. But it's like, but if you created the accounts and you went on there and you actually posted on these different platforms and you, get, you actually start to learn them, you would gain such a better understanding. It doesn't mean you have to become the social media expert, but now you start to gain an understanding of how these platforms function and how users make decisions. And like, just it, it, essentially you have to become obsessed, right? And as you, you know, gain a wider breadth of knowledge, that's where you start to gain ideas for different things, because it doesn't mean that it has to come from some, some other law firm or something within the legal industry. Some of our best ideas, you know, come from other industries. That's why a lot of the speakers that we bring on in terms of, you know, the guests on the podcast and the speakers at the summit, so on, like come from other industries because you can learn from another lawyer on, you know, customer service, client experience. But this year in, in November, we got Will Gadara and Will Gadara wrote the book, Unreasonable Hospitality. And Will Gadara runs one of the top Michelin star restaurants in the world. So wouldn't it be great to learn from someone like that on customer service and client experience? Similarly, how we brought in like the Ritz Carlton to some of the workshops. So I think it's, you have to be, it's basically expand where you're gathering your information because you, you'll gain a lot of like just better ideas. And sometimes if you don't have any ideas, it probably says you need to read a little bit more and maybe you need to learn a little bit more, maybe outside of your field. And I think it really just comes down to encouraging this amongst your team members as well and not giving everyone all the answers. Agreed. All right. Moving into question number two, Michael, after years of growing my firm, I finally hit some of my big goals that I set when I first started the firm. Now I'm worried about becoming complacent. How do you keep yourself and your firm from getting too comfortable? And what practices do you use to ensure you're always pushing the boundaries? Yeah, well, so when you set out to start your law firm, you had a vision and you set out and you had all these goals of things you wanted to achieve. And then you worked your ass off for so many years, diligently doing whatever it took, whether it was coming in on the weekends, whether it was holidays, you miss Thanksgiving, you miss Christmas, you miss New Year's. You were going nonstop, doing all the different trade-offs that were necessary. And then you finally did it. You hit your goals. What now? It's like, what do you do? Yeah. Everything that you were striving for, you've now achieved. You've now gotten to the top of whatever mountain that you were climbing. At the time, early on, like this was motivating and inspiring because you were at the bottom of the mountain and the journey to climb to the top, like that seemed like such a distance away. And now you did it. And it probably happened on a random ass day at a random ass time, you realized it. Like I remember early on in the business, when when we first hit a million, this was like one of my goals. I was like, man, by the time I hit 30, I want the business to grow to a million. And then it happened on like a Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon. I remember I went outside and I called my mom and she's like, okay. And then went back inside and we got back to work. And similarly, when we got married, the similar situation happened. Remember we hit our annual goal on the way to the wedding. Yeah, all yeah. The, literally, it was right before the, uh, what do you call it? Like rehearsal the, dinner. The rehearsal dinner. Yeah. Just in time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, Justin, I was like, why are you so happy at the rehearsal dinner? Yeah, we, like, were, we were actually toasting to that and not our wedding. <laughs> yeah, because well, the wedding happened, it was in December. It was like the end of the year and we were so close. Yeah, yeah. So we were toasting, yeah. yeah. So what next? Like, how do you, because I think the normal human tendency is that once you've achieved whatever goal you set out to achieve, it's to dial back, right? That this is how complacency happens and this is how, you start to get a little bit comfortable. And if you're asking this question, you want to avoid complacency because you know the complacency trap. You know what happens when you get comfortable because there's only two directions a business can go. You're either growing or you're dying. And if you're not growing, then guess what, right? The business is becoming less competitive. Things are going to get more difficult. But how do you, how do you manage that, right? I remember we had David Goggins on the podcast and he was like, it's easy to hustle when you have nothing. But what happens when you wake up in a warm home and you've got silk sheets and you have everything you ever wanted. It's like, how do you keep that fire burning? I mean, you see like Conor McGregor, for example, 
right? Like Conor McGregor coming up as a fighter in the UFC was just um, amazing, right? Like he had that eye of the tiger and now Conor McGregor, you know, is a multimillionaire, right? It's just one of the biggest names in, you know, in, in mixed martial arts. He had that proper 12, you know, that he sold his, uh, was like his whiskey brand. Oh yeah. And then, you know, he's been in movies now. He's in that movie like Jake Gyllenhaal on Amazon, right? Um, it was Roadhouse. It was like the, the remake. Terrible movie. I remember I watched it. I watched it just because I like Jake Gyllenhaal and I like Conor McGregor, but the movie itself was horrible. Yeah, I'm glad I sat that one out. And yet Conor hasn't won a fight in many years. He hasn't even fought in many years. And people say the same thing about Conor McGregor. It's like he made a ton of money and now he's on his yacht and he's relaxing and enjoying his life. It's like, what prevents you from getting complacent? Like who could blame him? I mean, he grew up with nothing. He was a plumber, right? Like, you know, he was doing like blue collar work and he grew up in Ireland and, you know, it's, and, and he's come a long way since then. And it just demonstrated what is possible and like the success that he's achieved. So how do you avoid this? Because this is a very dangerous trap to fall into. And the thing that I can tell you, the foolproof way of avoiding falling into this complacency trap is that once you've achieved these big goals you set out to achieve, you set bigger goals. You got to have a bigger vision now. Because what you've done is great, but that's all in the past now. And you're going to be motivated and excited if your future is always greater than your past, right? Like if you always are looking ahead saying, okay, that's all the things that I've done to this point have been, you know, the lessons, the building blocks, you know, uh, the capabilities and skills that I've gained up to this point is all preparation for what I'm going to do now into the future. So now you've got to set a more ambitious target because now you have to challenge yourself again. It has to be the type of vision. It has to be the type of goals that make you so uncomfortable. You don't even know where to start, right? Because it can't just be, okay, well, I'm going to take whatever we just achieved and increase it by 20%, right? Because I don't know that that's going to get you motivated or excited. And then also perhaps at this point, you know, it's no longer about the money. Maybe it was early on and you had nothing. And that was the driving factor of like, if I could just make enough money, then I can provide for the people around me and I could take, you know, vacations and, you know, I could pay off debt and, you know, that sort of thing. But now that you've done all that, what next? Well, now this is actually, this is where you truly get dangerous because now, and I mean this in a good way, is that now your vision is really about others. And now your vision is about like making a greater impact and serving others. And that's much, much more powerful. It's much more powerful when it goes from selfish to selfless, all right? When it's all about you, it's only you and your needs that are driving you. As soon as you satisfied your needs, if you focus on the needs of others, when you see like your clients succeed and you see your team members succeed and you see the impact you can make in your community, like now, now you've got a bigger cause. That's a very, very powerful motivator. So you just got to find what excites you and that's up to you. It might just be, maybe you do want to make more money. That's fine too. Maybe you say, you know what? I've got like this car, but I really want a boat. Maybe I got a boat, but I really want a yacht. Maybe I was flying coach now I fire first class and I want to fly private. Yeah. Like that's up to you too. I'm not here to judge you. You can want what you want. It's your life. You know, or you can instead say, you know what? We've been impacting this amount of people and this is the impact we've been making in our community. And I want to make an even greater impact. Okay. I want to build schools. I want to clean up the streets. I want to be able to make a, such an incredible impact in our community. I want to build playgrounds. You know, yeah. we built a playground. We did. So you just figure out what is the cause that drives you. And it can take some time, but you got to have to set bigger goals. And if you keep setting bigger goals, you're never going to get complacent because now you're always going to be learning and growing. And there's always that next mountain. It's like you climb a little hill, then you kind of climb a bigger mountain. Then before you know it, you're climbing Everest. Then if you climbed Everest, now you're saying, okay, now I want to go to the moon. Then you go to the moon. Now you want to go to Mars. You know, and you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. And, you know, some people say, well, what's the point of it all? What's the point of it all, right? Well, you got to spend your time some way. It's more fulfilling if you do it in a productive way where you're making a positive impact and you're benefiting others. Yeah. But that's completely up to you. You can lounge out and hang out, you know, by the pool all day long too. But eventually you're going to get bored and your business is going to suffer. So you have to also consider, because it's no longer about you, maybe you achieved your initial vision, but now it's about helping others achieve their visions. Maybe you have people in your organization where you've got to create a vision big enough for everyone else's vision to fit in it. So there's things that maybe your team members want to achieve. Maybe there's you know, things you want to be able to impact in terms of your clients and your community. So that's really the foolproof solution. You got to set bigger goals. Think back to how, you know, when you first set the, the goals, when you started your firm, how excited you were. That's what drove you. Got, you out of bed every single morning. Now you need to set an even bigger goal than what you set initially. That's going to get you somewhere excited. And it's going to challenge you and push you. And it has to challenge and push you because if it's easy, you're not going to care. And it's not going to motivate you. Sometimes it's throwing yourself back into the fire that just motivates and excites. And you, gives you do you it purpose. that way. Yeah, it gives you purpose and you're never going to get complacent. Yeah. yeah. All right. To round us out today, it feels like every other week there's a new challenge or crisis to deal with from market shifts to unexpected client demands. 
How do I build resilience within myself and my team to not only survive, but thrive in these unpredictable times? Well, I feel like you've answered this before. Yeah. But it keeps coming up, so I'll answer it again. <laughs> Here we <laughs> yeah. go. How do I, you know, like... Times are hard. How times do I are get hard stronger? And, and How business do I get is hard. Better? Yes. I mean, look, when were times easy and when was business easy? It's business. It's the nature of it. I mean, you signed up for this. I mean, did anybody else sign you up to, you know, to run your law firm and to start a law firm? I mean, you made this choice. And if you want somebody else to deal with all the headaches and all the challenges, then you can go work for somebody. But because you decided that you wanted to start a law firm, I mean, you are signing up for being in the arena. And that means there's going to be market shifts. And that means there's going to be volatility. And that means there's going to be things that don't go your way because you are competing against other people as well that also want to be successful and also want to grow their business and also want attention in terms of getting their content out there, getting exposure, getting cases. They want those same things too. They want to provide for their teams. They want to provide for their families. They want to make a positive impact for their clients. They want to make a positive impact in their community. They want to do those things too. And when you're in an arena, when you've got hundreds, if not thousands of those individuals, it is survival of the fittest, my friend. So how do you make yourself more resilient or how do you make your team more resilient? I don't know that you can read about it. I don't know that you read about it in the book. It's like, how do you learn to ice skate, right? It's like, you don't read about it in a book. Although when I was a kid, I actually did read a book on ice skating because I was playing hockey and you know, I got this book at the library. It was written by a former NHL player on like you know, skating technique. And I could read it all day long, but it wasn't until I went to the rink yeah. and actually like was practicing these types of techniques. So you're not going to learn to ice skate from a book. You're only going to learn through actual practical experience. And my point there is that you're not going to get resilient by thinking about being resilient or reading about being resilient. You're going to get more resilient when you're faced, you know, facing difficult situations and you persist and you push through them. So that's how you strengthen any sort of muscle. It's like same way. I know we discussed it on a prior podcast. It's like, how do you become more patient? Where you're put in situations to test your patience and then you're able to navigate those types of situations without losing your cool. So it's the same thing for your team. You want to build a more resilient team, put them in under more difficult situations, like go through stressful things together. You know, it's amazing. It's like, I think back over, you know, the last, like since the inception of the business and we're coming up on our seventh conference. I remember we said this the other day. It was like interesting that our events team has been the same events team since the first conference we're coming up on number seven, you know, all these years later, and it's been the same team. And I was like, you know, I wonder why that is. And it's because we have been in the foxhole with one another and we've developed a level of like trust with one another. Yeah. We've done such difficult things. And we've been under such stress that I believe those bonds, those relationships developed, right? That we became strong with one another. So if you want to build a more resilient team, you got to go to war together. Don't make things easier, right? You accept more, you know, challenging goals. Yeah. You know, become more ambitious, raise the standard, expect more of one another. And, you know, there's going to be some people, obviously, that that's not for them, but that's okay. Because again, what are you trying to build here? Are you trying to build resilience or are you trying to build bitch assness? Okay. <laughs> it's like, if you were trying to build the opposite of resilience, then you would take things away and you would lighten the load and you would make things easier and you would coddle and you would just put people in bubbles, you know, like it's like bubble boy, right? Like that's what you would do is that would be the opposite yes. of building resilience. So if you want to build a more resilient team, again, it comes back to the fact of like, you have to go through difficult situations and you have to put yourself in challenging situations. You take on more difficult cases. You set more ambitious targets. In general, you raise the standard of expectations for everyone, yourself included, right? You want to lead, you know, lead by example. And it's the same thing with yourself. And you find yourself going through a difficult situation. I mean, look, you want to kill resilience, meaning that like you want to become less resilient, just give up. This has been my fear. I remember I had this conversation with, uh, you know, one of our leaders the other day and he's a retired Navy SEAL. All throughout, you know, the various experiences you've had in your life, whether it was BUDS, you know, like just Navy SEAL training or even any of the deployments that you did. I mean, I imagine it was incredibly difficult. Why didn't you ever give up? Right? Like, why didn't you just ever like tap out? You have to imagine there were times where you thought about it. I asked him this and, you know, he shared with me just like, you know, just his upbringing and like what his vision for himself and the person that he wanted to be and the example he wanted to set for his family and his children and so on. And he had a very, very, very clear vision and that kept him going. And for me, I've also looked at this, you know, because he asked me the question too. My thought is always that I believe that quitting can become a habit and I'm scared to death that if I quit one thing, I'll start quitting other things. Now, there's obviously a time where like, obviously something's not going to make sense. You have to quit. Sure. Right. Someone's going to come up with their own weird justification, right? Yes. For their own quitting. Right. But 99.99999% of the time, 
it becomes a habit because when things get tough, if your immediate impulse is to give up or throw in the towel, then what do you think you're going to do when you're experiencing something else that's difficult? And this is why, like, when you're seeing, like, even society today, people are raising kids, and this is what I'm scared to death of. Parents ask themselves, like, how do I build resilient children, right? I want resilient kids. I want kids that can stand on their own. I want them to be, like, people that are, you know, confident, that have skills, that believe in themselves, and so on. Well, I think the way to do that, or at least the way to not do that, is to lighten their load and make things easier for them. We are the people that we are, you know, and, and speaking of so many of our coaching members, some of the most impressive human beings have gone through the most incredible adversity, like the most difficult childhoods, the most difficult times in their business. Like they've been screwed over. They've had so many things not go their way. It's been so, so difficult that a reasonable human being would have given up a long time ago. And they are now so grateful and so positive and so resilient because they didn't give up when things got difficult. So maybe you as the leader, you know, even if you're asking this question, this tells me that you're a quitter. Probably at some point you quit things right? You start to do something, you gain a little bit of momentum, right? Things are good. Things are fun, right? As soon as it starts to get boring or difficult, that's when you start to tap out. That's when your commitment starts to dwindle. If instead you were to double down, right? Not everything has to be fun and exciting. Not every day has to be something that you love and you wake up with a smile on your face. Some days you're going to wake up and you're going to be beat to shit and you don't want to come in and deal with what you have to deal with. But that's how you build resilience by attacking every single day. If you rely on motivation, then every day is going to be peaks and valleys, right? Some days you feel like it, some days you don't. But if you can come in and execute and do the things that need to be done, irrespective of how you feel, then you're going to become a more resilient individual. And you build resilience like a muscle because there's going to be things that test you more. And some of the strongest people that I know, like they are strong because of all of the adversity that they've overcome. And how they overcome that adversity? They didn't quit. So you set that example first. You are the leader that's the example that people are going to model, right? Things are caught, not taught sort of thing. And you can build a more resilient team by not lightening their load, by holding them to a higher standard. And you can hold others to a higher standard when you hold yourself to a higher standard first. So if you can set that example and be that example as a leader, well, now you're going to start building a resilient organization. Love it. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Have a great day. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with Michael Mogul. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that we can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of Michael's book absolutely free at gamechangingattorney.com. Number two, you can shoot Michael a text at 404-531-7691 and ask him any question you'd like. You might just hear the answer on the next episode. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it will help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on this episode, see the show notes in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com.